Why so nervous? Damn. I don't know. <laughs> oh, we're live now. Just me and you. Has anyone joined us yet? I don't know. Yeah. Can we tell if anyone is watching? <laughs> no, it's just that we're going to basically have a really embarrassing and awkward conversation with each other for half an hour on our own. Probably. <laughs> um, okay, I guess we can get started. So, hi everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in to this week's episode of Coffee Conversations with Gorongosa Coffee. Uh, my name is Jen Guyton, and I'm your guest host today. Uh, I'm a freelance photographer who focuses mo mostly on wildlife and conservation issues. I spent six amazing years working in Gorongosa National Park. First, I was doing my PhD in ecology, and then I was a Fulbright National Geographic Storytelling Fellow. Um, one of the things I was lucky enough to do when I was in Gorongosa was to assist Charlie Hamilton James, our guest today, on the Gorongosa story that he photographed for National Geographic magazine. I'm really excited to be talking to him today about our adventures in the park and about his work as a National Geographic photographer and fellow. Charlie's extraordinary photography centers mostly around conservation, natural history, and anthropology. And he's maybe best known for his work on, in Yellowstone National Park, on African vultures, and in the Amazon. Uh, Charlie actually got his start as a presenter and filmmaker, and in 2014, he released a documentary series called I Bought a Rainforest, which is about his per purchase sight unseen of a 100-acre plot of land in Peru. Fun fact, it actually turned out to be an illegal coca plantation. So, Charlie, um, oh, well, before we get started, I should say, remember, everybody, to leave your questions in the comments for the chance to win a coffee trio. Coffee or what? Coffee trio. A, I guess you're it's going to have to tell everyone what that is, aren't you? <laughs> it's a, it's a three different blends of Gorongosa oh, coffee. Very nice. Yeah. Which is All good because right, so, I've drunk it. I don't want to sound like an advert, but it's good coffee. It is good coffee. Yeah. I really enjoy it, yeah. Um, so, Charlie, can you tell your audience, tell our audience a little mm -hmm. bit about yourself and what drew you to wildlife photography? Um, so I was, oh, I was always obsessed with, um, with kingfishers as a kid. I mean, I was seven, I got obsessed with kingfishers and, um, you know, in England, they're the only really exciting, colorful bird we've got. So, um, I wanted to kind of channel this interest and eventually I ended up taking pictures of kingfishers and I didn't, I mean, I didn't get a decent picture till I was in my early thirties. Um, but that kind of obsession had to go somewhere and, and it went into photography and then and then otters took over that obsession. And so, it, you know, I, I guess I have a career based on childhood obsessions of with kingfishers and otters. And now, now I've just kind of ended up becoming a photographer. So, That's pretty And cool. it's fun. Good job. It's fun yeah. Can we? yeah, it's all right. <laughs> um, so you said that the Gorongosa story that you shot for the magazine um, was maybe one of the nicest stories that you've ever shot. Um, can you explain what you meant by that? I think Goran goes, uh, I mean, just before I even left, just looking at pictures of it and researching it online, it just looked like this kind of golden, emerald green and golden idyll in uh, Southern Africa. And then when I got there, I realized that actually it was. And it was just astoundingly beautiful. Um, it was an easy place to work, quite honestly. It it, it wasn't, um, I guess because it's kind of having its rebirth and, you know, you were there long before I was, but we're still kind of in the middle of that rebirth. So t to see it kind of coming back and and to have the freedom to work there in such an incredibly beautiful place was you know, the whole thing was just a joy. I mean, I'm not saying I wasn't frustrated occasionally, but but the actual just process of being there with lovely people and amazing wildlife and beautiful scenery was just made it a pleasure to shoot. Yeah. And I think there's something um, really refreshing about working on a positive conservation story. Um, I know a lot of the other stories you've worked on are were a lot more intense like uh your poisoning story for example i bet that was a much different experience yeah and i just come off the back of um i've done vultures and poisoning um both in eastern southern africa 
and they were really miserable stories. And I was kind of getting sick of, of um, I was getting sick of shooting miserable stuff. I was also getting, you know, kind of sick of um, kind of casting Africa with misery. And I didn't want to. It was it's such a vibrant and lively and growing place in in some in, in as far as conservation goes and it, it, it was just too easy to keep casting it down and actually gone goes was a brilliant example of what amazing work is happening there and i you know what i think we all sort of geographic sh we should be championing rather than just depressing people and so to and that really changed me really in the way i shoot because you know to go from elephants having their tusks and and um and trunks cut off and just blood and misery. I'd gone to this just this amazing place where suddenly everything was happening in the right direction, I guess. And it was a it was a kind of moment for me. And also, you know, I'd talked to Amy Vitali about this, a colleague at Geographic. And Amy had been kind of impressing on me with her work, this kind of move towards positive conservation rather than negative conservation stories. And Goran Goza really encapsulated that. Mm. Why do you think it's important? for us to be telling positive conservation stories? Because we, we live in a feed of misery these days. <laughs> you know, I, I go through my Instagram feed sometimes in the morning. I had to leave Twitter because it was just misery. And I go through Instagram and it's just, just, just misery, 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 misery. And I don't think it does us any good anymore. It just makes us depressed. And it gets, I remember I was on Instagram or Twitter one then I scrolled past, you know, the last white northern white rhino and I just scrolled past it and I caught myself. I thought, wow, you know, I just did that. And that really sort of said to me, this isn't right. This way that we're consuming information and particularly about conservation, because that's where we work, this isn't right. And we and and so that really sort of changed it for me. We need to recast it, make it interesting, engaging, optimistic, even if it isn't always optimistic. We need to find ways of telling stories that that help rather than create negativity, which is, I think, what we do too often. Yeah, definitely. Um, Larissa, give Larissa away. Hello. Uh, we love Larissa. Stan and Gary <laughs> <Gorgeous> today. <laughs> All right, um, so one of my favorite photos from the magazine story is the opener with the elephant. Um, and I think mm -hmm. part of the reason that people love it so much is because it genuinely looks like a dinosaur in Jurassic Park and it's just the most amazing thing. Um, but also part of the reason that I love it is that I was there with you when you shot it and um, I know how much time you put into getting that photo. And so I just thought it would be fun if you could tell the audience sort of the, the story behind that photo. So, well, what's funny about that photo is that, I mean, you and I drove around, what's that river called? It's not the Musakazi. Where, where was it? The Urema River, didn't we? And for nights, evenings on end. Yeah. So we'd leave at like 4, 3.30, 4 o'clock, wouldn't we, when it was really hot. Yeah to try and create an image that was, I guess, I wanted that idyll, that new Eden, that, that's what I wanted. And we kind of, and we hadn't got a decent elephant picture, had we? We'd been there a long time, didn't have a decent elephant picture. So I had this shot in my head and I wanted a family of elephants and the beautiful sunset and the trees and that kind of just that, you know, kind of Eden-like rebirth image. And the gold and the green, because I love gold and green. And like the whole of the Gorongosa story to me was just gold and green. That's what yeah. I have in my head. And we got that shot. I can't remember how long we've been doing. We got that shot after a week or so. And I didn't really like it because it wasn't what I or elephants in it. So I, and what I often do is um, that I'm so fixated on getting one thing that I don't look at the thing that I've got that's in front of me. And I don't look at it objectively as an image, I look at it as a failure. So that image I just looked at as, as a failure, I hadn't got it. And so we kept going after that, still trying to get another picture. And then one day I kind of re-looked at it and thought, oh, that's not a bad picture, is it? I was quite happy. Um, and it ended up being actually one of my favorite pictures, but it took time to, to get there. But um, I mean, I, 
I was on foot when I took that picture, wasn't I? It's a bit naughty. <laughs> yeah, but it's an amazing photo. And then, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, I did a little sneak. Yeah. But that bull elephant was, I mean, he only reached up once or very twice into mm -hmm. that tree. And then he was just wandering off. And um, a lot of those elephants, I mean, you know far better than I, are pretty aggressive because they were, they were hunted and poached for so long, weren't they? Yeah. So those those bulls were kind of relaxed with two of them. Yeah, yeah. And I remember. Have you been we... charged by them? There? What is that? Have you ever been charged by the elephants there? Oh yeah, uh, multiple times. Not so much um, in the last couple of years. I was there. They, I could tell that they were already getting so much better. Just like within the six years that I was working there, at the beginning, um, they were charging cars fairly regularly you know i mean the elephants remembered the war there are some that are still alive that have bullet holes in their ears from the civil right. war it's an incredible thing and and they have long memories as everyone knows and um so naturally they had a fear of humans but um just from having you know conservationists working in the park and tourists working in the, uh you know tourists coming to the park and uh them being exposed to all these people who are there to protect them and not to harm them, they've already become so much better. And the, the, the amount of regression has dropped down to almost zero, you know, just in those six years, which is an amazing thing. Yeah. I, I noticed Dominique is, is, uh, is watching us today. Who's our, our champion elephant person down there. And yeah. uh, I learned a lot about those Gorongosa elephants working with Dominique as well. Yeah, she's yeah. doing amazing work. Yeah. Anyway, so that's how we got that picture. And uh, yes, we put it on the geographic Instagram feed, and everyone thought it was a dinosaur. Yeah, <laughs> really, it looks like one. Uh, Maybe one day we'll <laughs> use dinosaurs back in Gorgosa. Yeah, that's secretly <laughs> what the scientists are doing behind the scenes there. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so the, the other photo I wanted to ask you about um, was one that I think didn't actually run sort of in the body of the story, but was at the front of the magazine, right? Which was um, your image of the crocodile with, uh, that was lying on the bank with the sunset behind it. And um, that's probably my second favorite in the story. So um, can you tell us how you got that one? Well... I mean, that was, that croc was there. I mean, she was there for weeks, wasn't she? She was just lying on the, on the bank above the, that was the Musakazi, wasn't it? River. That was, was the Musakazi. Yeah. So she was lying and she was, I guess, on eggs under that she had buried in that bank. So she wasn't going anywhere. And everyone kind of knew her when they drove past her and the lions knew where she was. And, but the view behind her was kind of special. I like, I like uh, shots where the animal's in their environment. Same with the elephant. You know, the elephant's in its environment. And as a photographer shooting for a magazine, that's far more interesting than just a picture of an elephant or a picture of a crocodile. So my job really is to tell a story and an image. And um, to have the crocodile with the river behind and the scenery behind is a much nicer way of taking a picture of a crocodile for me than just a photo of a crocodile's head or whatever. Yeah. So... So we had this kind of workable scene. You could get really pretty close to her in the car. You know, she would just sit there. So we had this scene where you think, okay, so, you know, it's one o'clock in the afternoon. There she is sitting there. It doesn't look so good, but we could do something with this. So I don't know how many times you and I went there at dawn, probably seven. Yeah, it sounds about right. At least a week, most mornings, just waiting for the perfect dawn. And then each day we were, I mean, we lit it. We had a flash gun on it. Um, because one of the things about wildlife often, is there's certainly a crocodile on a muddy bank just lying there on the sand. Is you're going to, you know, the, it kind of blends in. So, I mean, you did amazing lighting work. We had a, we had a great long pole with a flash gun on it. And your job was to, to reach that pole out just so it just went the other side of the crocodile's head. Right about, you know, what was it? Seven or eight feet above the crotch. She didn't move. And, and the idea was just to put a little bit of light and just lift her off the background. And then the key was balancing that with the, with the dawn. And so that's what 
it took so long. But it, I, I like the image in the end. I got really, it's the same with the elephant. I get really frustrated because it's not perfect. And then a few weeks or days after I've taken it, I look back at it and I've forgotten what it is that made it imperfect. And then I look at it, oh, I quite like that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it was such a cool shot. And um, yeah, I thought it was amazing that you could envision that by putting just a little bit of light behind the crocodile, um, you could sort of elevate it to that next level. But um, yeah, it's really funny because, you know, when you think about um, photography, people think about sort of these high tech tools and, and we were literally using like a really long pole with a flash duct tape to the end of it. <laughs> yeah. And I, I was holding the filter over the camera. I do, you know, the, these things, you can't buy these things off the shop. So you just have to improvise and, yeah. and mess up until eventually you get something. Yeah. But yeah, that, I like that image in the end. Yeah. It was nice. I was going back through the images yesterday to, to post one on Instagram to plug this. And, it, you know, it just kind of floods all these memories back of this, you know, just hanging out with the animals in Gorongosa, which was, and the people. Mm. It was just so much fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so another thing that we did was um, we actually spent time on Mount Gorongosa photographing among the, the Gorongosa Coffee Project. Um, so I was hoping you could talk a little bit about what that experience was like for you. Uh, honestly, I found it pretty frustrating. I mean, it was an amazing place, but I'm not very good at photographing coffee projects, I discovered. And <laughs> so, you know, my, my job is to, to, to go in armed with a level of information. I'm not the writer, so I'm not overly armed. I need to know where this situation sits within a bigger story. So I tend to go in kind of like that. I got a bit of knowledge. Um, and then I have to translate that into a workable image. I say workable, I mean an image that's going to stand out in National Geographic yeah. magazine. And sometimes I can't do that. And I, I really struggle. I mean, the, the, what frustrates frustrated me about that shoot is that it was so stunningly beautiful, mm -hmm. and I couldn't, I, I couldn't do my job properly and, and get the image of it that I wanted. But, and to have, you know, people, work, I mean, the set situation was that the the coffee is being grown on. Correct me if I'm wrong. Grown on the mountain um, to bring economics into the to the buffer zone area of the national park because um, without economics and money and for people, uh, how can they prosper and how can the park prosper? So that was the kind of view we were trying to get. And the coffee project's a fantastic example of small localized economy that helps people out and has a positive effect. So that's what we're trying to get. So we want it to, we want the just to kind of reflect that and at the same time we want to show the mountain in the background and the people working in the foreground and everything else but and it was all uh, stunningly beautiful i just uh, just didn't get a picture of <laughs> people picking coffee in the way that i like no but, but um we did get some, i mean I, that image we took um that evening it was an image of a family and the wife was making dinner and the guys were all just sitting around and that's actually one of my favorite ever pictures. And in the background is the, is the mountain. And, you know, and I call that image, to me, I didn't call it to anyone else, I call that image grinding poverty because that was an image of absolute grinding poverty. And it, you know, without things like the Coffee Project coming along, um, people are going to continue living like that. You know, I was talking to, to one of the guys who runs the Coffee Project saying this is some of the poorest people he's seen in Africa. I mean, that place needs that lift. And I think that the images we were trying to get um, were about giving it that lift. That makes yeah, sense. exactly. Yeah. And, and I think that's one of the, the things that makes Gorongosa so great and makes conservation in Gorongosa so successful is that it doesn't just focus on the wildlife, but it also focuses on, um, you know, bringing opportunity and um, bringing a benefit to the people that live around the national park because they're the ones that have to share the space with the wildlife. And if, um, you know, if the park doesn't benefit them, then it's, it becomes very hard to conserve it in the long term. Yeah, and I think what's happening there is just kind of 
is a is a symbiosis, yeah. isn't it? That's what you want. It's not just growing. It's what we want everywhere. We want local people invested in their landscape for the for everyone's health and happiness, exactly. including the animals and the landscape. And and I think the the the, the mountain, the Gorongosa Mountain, is I guess the starkest example of of that happening. And I noticed Larissa's mentioning the reforestation. You know that that amazing ecosystem around the you know those, those kind of um, I mean you you've been there and seen the forests there that have been. They're so biodiverse, so amazing, and that was one of the things that really stood out about Gorongosa was these incredible forests on the on the mountain. That so much studying still needs to go on there, but so much has been lost. And now, you know, the coffee project and uh, and I guess local incentive and economics is going to hopefully bring back that forest through through reforestation. So, so, and I see this all over the world. It's not just in in, in Gorongosa. It's the same in the Amazon. And you start. We're starting to see this conservation movement towards mac, uh, you know micro macroeconomics and local people being in charge of their land and that's what it's all about moving away from this this colonial ideal of protected areas and that's yeah. what i think goran goes is absolutely ahead of the curve on definitely and i think it's a it's a really important model for other protected areas you know throughout the developing world and i hope that more of them sort of take the approach that that Gorongos mm. is taking get that's the future of conservation absolutely um and i'm curious what do you think um you know what role do you think conservation storytelling like the kind of work that you and i do what role does that have in the greater scheme of conservation I, um I'm always kind of funny. I get asked this question a lot because, because you know, the nature of the stories. I, did. you know, I did a story on vultures, one of the most important stories to me that I did, and I got interviewed at the Geographic, and they said, you know, do you think this will change anything? And I, and I answered really honestly. I said, no, I don't think it will change anything, because the, the issues of you know conservation of vultures in Africa, are not really. Um, well, the, the reader of National Geographic is not really involved in, in conservation of vultures in eastern southern Africa. So I think they have a value in certain, um, in certain spheres, and I, but, and I also don't think they have a value. In, but I, know, I think as photographers and storytellers, we have to be really honest about that, because it's great to think that all the work we do is, is good and useful because it's positive. But, it, you know, actually, we've got to really look at what we do and think, okay, how is this of benefit to anyone and uh, when is it of benefit to anyone? And I think what the geographic can do because of its reach and and kind of uh, reputation is it can influence governments. And I think bringing positive stories about a location within a country and highlighting it on a, works on a governmental level. And that can, that can infect and include policy. And I think that's when it's working and i yeah. you, you know to, to, to the idea that you know we can do a story on the and how devastating that um and catastrophic the decline in africa's vultures is in geographic and expect it to do any good is is ludicrous we can expect it to raise awareness but raising awareness doesn't really fix problems i think going in shooting a story on goring goes or saying to the world look this incredible place is being reborn firstly come to it African mm -hmm. tourism and secondly to the government look at this incredible amazing thing you've got in your country your country is amazing it's got this incredible resource it's got these amazing people these amazing animals it's something you should be really really proud of and that's going to encourage governments to protect their natural resources and that's the same in so many countries we go to you know developing countries are expected by the west to just look after their natural resources at great you know and and not extract from them and at great cost to their economies and we expect right. them to do that and it's ludicrous because we don't do it in the west and it's a honestly i think a lot of these really important protected areas that are in often desperately poor countries i you know 
we just expect them to be looked after. And they are looked after, actually, globally, pretty well by a lot of those countries. And we should be really championing that. Everyone should when it happens. Because, because you know, if you look at lots of places in the Amazon, their resources are sitting underneath them and they aren't being touched. Some of them are, some of them aren't. People need food, people need protein, people need resources to survive. And if we, if we can create places like Gorongosa that allow the symbiosis between the needs of humans, the needs of people, often very poor people, to survive, and we can Im in impact on the government what, what good job they're often doing. And I don't know the politics of, of Mozambique, but basically you've got this amazing resource. Be proud of it. Your whole country should be proud of it. We should all be proud of it globally. And that's, I yeah. think, the way that we can impact people with our stories, despite me mumbling around there. <laughs> those are different territories. <laughs> I think yeah, I, I, think those are... <laughs> I hope I did. You hope you don't what? I hope I made sense. Oh, you did. Yeah. No, I think those are really good points. Um, <laughs> And I think you're definitely right that the burden of, of places like the Amazon shouldn't be on, of conserving places like the Amazon shouldn't be on the local people. It should be on everyone, the whole world. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, all right. So we have a couple of questions from the audience. Um, the first one is from Edson. Hi, Edson. What is the most remarkable wildlife moment you have ever photographed, Charlie? Oh. Mm. I think it was, I was filming some lions well, a long time ago, 15 years ago in the Maslow Mara, and there were three female lions asleep at the bottom of a termite mound, and you couldn't see them, I couldn't see them from the car, because the termite mound was in front of them, and a young male lion walked up the termite mound, not knowing that the females would lie asleep on the other side of it. And suddenly, all three of them exploded over the top of the termite man and beat the hell out of this male lion. <laughs> and they rolled wow. him on his back. And these three girls just, <laughs> just gave him a really good kicking. And he got up and ran off. And I think that was probably the most dramatic wildlife spectacle I've had. That sounds amazing. Um, can people see that footage anywhere? I don't know. It's, I've often tried to find it on YouTube, but. It, I mean, it got, it got used a lot because it was lion. When you're making wildlife film, lion fights are so rare to actually get that that, that bit of footage got used a lot. But I don't know. You know it's so long ago, and it's like, let's get out of this. Okay. Um, all right. Second question is from Eric Is there something in Gorongosa that you wanted to photograph but haven't had a chance to yet? Um, the leopard would be nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what's interesting about Gorongosa, isn't it? There's there's no hyenas yeah. and there's very few leopards and the leopard thing just never really made sense to me. I mean it's the most perfect leopard country. And it's jam packed with impala and baboons and warthogs. Yeah. And you I mean you couldn't just you couldn't create better leopard country. Yet there's very few leopards there, aren't there? Yeah, it's you know, weird. I'm asking you because you, you yeah. you're the expert. I'm not. <laughs> yeah, there were uh, there were very few leopard sightings. I think um, the entire time I was there, there was maybe one or two sightings. Um, I think they're they've been working on reintroductions for a while, um, but I don't know when that's that's going to happen. And there are definitely leopards in the surrounding hunting concessions that's mm. the really incredible thing is that we know there are healthy leopard populations nearby just not inside the park it appears so i guess weird. in answer to the question it's basically that animals that are due back is what i wanted to photograph mm. and one day one day they will there'll be hyenas there'll be leopards and gorongosa mm. whether they wander in or get reintroduced <laughs> yeah um all right next question is from bex do you get a choice on assignments? How often do you get to pitch a story that you want to do? So it's about 50-50, I'd say. I pitch uh, and I accept. So 
what am I doing at the moment? I'm doing Serengeti at the moment, mm. which was a um, story I pitched. We had, the Geographic hadn't done the Serengeti properly for 30 years. So when I discovered that, it was like falling into a gold mine. <laughs> you, know, you just know that story is going to work for the magazine. Um, and I'm doing uh, Sea Otters. And yeah. So sometimes they'll come to me with a story, and sometimes I go to them. And uh, that's kind of how it works. But Gorongosa, they came to me with, and uh, I'm very glad and happy about that. Yeah. Just cool. would like to get back there one day. Yeah, well, actually, the next question is from Larissa, and she wants to know when you're coming back to Gorongosa. Uh, probably not in any hurry. As much as I'd <laughs> like to, the thing is, I'm working all the time, and unless I'm so I'm basically just wherever I'm working, and um, I'd love to come back. I will, but I've been saying I'd love to go back to the highlands of Ethiopia now for 20-something years, and I still haven't got back there. So, uh, no, I, but I, the thing about um, Goran Goza that draws me back as much as the place is just seeing old friends from the, you know, I, I think I only spent seven weeks there, but I just met a bunch of really cool people yeah. who I stay in touch with still. Yeah, that place is jam-packed with amazing people doing amazing yeah. things. Mm. Like Larissa. Yeah, exactly. Like Larissa. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Uh, well, I guess we don't have any more questions. So I can announce the winner of the draw, which is Eric. Yay, Eric. Well done, Eric. You get your Gorongos a copy. <laughs> um, all right. Is there anything else, Charlie, that you want to say about um, your work or about Gorongosa before we break? No, I just would encourage people to, I guess, put it on the list. You, you know, when people talk about going to Africa, going on safari, it's it's not there yet as on the list, but it should be on the list because it it needs people and uh, people should go and see it. It's an amazing place. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Um, great. Well, thanks so much, Charlie, for joining us and telling us about your amazing work in Gorongosa. And thank you to our amazing audience for tuning in. Um, and please, everybody, tune in next week for another episode of Coffee Conversations to learn. And you can learn even more about Gorongosa Coffee at gorongosacoffee.com. Thanks so Bye. much, everybody. Cheers. Bye.